Welcome back to the Physique Development Podcast. Today we have another guest, and it is Miss Rachel Haig. She is the co owner of a company called Connect Her. She has actually hosted over 200 events before she even turned 24 years old. It started with live workouts at a park turned into Austin's Boss Babes, then turned into helping female entrepreneurs connect with like-minded businesswomen. And now that is what we come here today with Connect Her. She does live events, webinars, deep transformational events, and it's all about women's entrepreneurship and networking in Austin, Texas. And at Connect Her, their main focus is to connect you with strategies, resources, mentors, and community that you need to grow their business. And she also has a podcast, so I'll make sure that I leave the links for learning more about her company as well as her podcast um, down below. But on their podcast, they're actually about to launch season two of their podcast, and it's her and her co-owner, Sam. And they have other top experts in the industry as they share the exact strategies that they use to teach to reach success so you can take the practical steps in taking your business to the next level. So welcome to the show, Rachel. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. I could tell you did a whole deep dive there <laughs> on the connector journey with Austin Boss Babes back in the day. Uh, but I'm happy to be here. Yes. Is there anything I missed about Connector that you would want to share or let people know? No, that was pretty much a good overview. We just like to say Connector, the community was built by every woman a part of it, not just by us. Um, and I'm very blessed to have that community and be able to lead it. Yeah, I love that. And if you didn't already think that she was a badass by saying that she's hosted over 200 events before she turned 24 years old, but she has also built and scaled multiple six-figure companies from marketing agencies to coaching to various sales teams. So um, she is a certified badass. And that's actually what we're going to be talking about to some degree today of what it is to be a business owner and also still take care of yourself and take care of your health. So this is still going to be applicable if you're just a busy human because they they do overlap to a certain degree. But especially for anyone who is an entrepreneur or a business owner, we're going to be diving into what that really looks like for Rachel and I um, having teams and managing all of that while still taking care of ourselves, which is very, very important. And I actually saw something about um, when I was looking at your journey from all the way back to like the Austin's Boss Babes and the live workouts at the park, you have had a whiteboard that you were tracking your habits on and it had talked about of like how important it is to not lose sight of taking care of yourself and that's how you did it of tracking habits on a whiteboard and I think there was a note of saying like this is still something that we do today uh, so I wanted to learn a little bit more about your habit tracking and your whiteboard yeah absolutely so I mean whether you're a busy human or you're a business owner, I think the number one thing that leads us to our success is taking care of yourself and being able to show up the best for your kids, for your family, for your clients, for your team, and working out and eating healthy and our self-care and meditation practices is also the first thing that we typically put on the back burner when we get super busy. Um, and so it's kind of a two-handed thing there. And there were so many seasons when Sam, my business partner, and I started Connector um, where we would get really wrapped up in building the business, really wrapped up into nurturing our clients or marketing or sales or all the different pieces. And we'd realize, oh, I didn't take care of myself today. I didn't even shower this week, right? I haven't really made a meal or I haven't worked out. And we realized when we did that, we weren't able to show up the best for our clients. So we started with this giant whiteboard in my business partner's living room and we drew out all these little boxes for us to check off our habits every day. And it was a green marker if we did it. It was an orange marker if we like, you know, half-assed it. I don't know (laughs) if I can cuss on here. Um, And then it was a red marker if we didn't do it. And then we would figure out, you know, what were the patterns? What were we not doing every single day? And how can we make sure we fit that into our schedule? And I still do it. It's been four years. I have my whiteboard. There's also an app called the Habits app that is pretty much a virtual version where you can color coat and check mark your habits. But it's really been a game changer for us. And we do it with our clients as well to check everybody else's habits and keep each other accountable. I love that. What are the habits on your whiteboard right now? Right now. So I'm a martial artist as well. So I like to make sure I get my martial arts in at least once a week with my trainer and then lift at least three times, four times a week, walk every day, um, meditate or do visualization for at least 10 to 30 minutes every single day, water. 
um, reading or listening to an educational podcast, and then quality time with myself and with my loved ones. And how do you feel like those have been going? Because I know you've been going through a busy season. You had some travel recently. Uh, How'd it go trying to navigate all those still? Jim definitely gets put on the back burner every once in a while. (laughs) That and drinking water. I don't know why it is just those two. It's like I got to push myself to get there. Um, But we've been able to be pretty consistent. I think the best thing for me is sharing it with my business partner, sharing it with Alex, my partner, sharing it with um, my team even, Hey, this is my goals for this week. Let's all accomplish these goals. And then having somebody to have to talk to about mm-hmm. it, if you don't <laughs> do it, um, definitely keeps things in line, but I think it, uh, there's ebbs and flows. There's seasons for everything and you, nobody's ever going to be perfect. No matter how much balance you have, no matter how many team members you have helping you take care of the business, there's always going to be seasons where some things get put on the back burner, but you excel in other areas and then vice versa. So yeah, we're in a season where getting to the gym consistently was a challenge for a little bit, but we're getting back at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's never going to be that perfection. And sometimes I used to let that hold me back of being like, well, if it's not going to be perfect, then why even do it at all? But now I look at it from the lens of like, it's not going to be perfect. So like, I might as well just do something instead of getting wrapped up and thinking like everything has to be perfectly checked off because consistency matters so much more than just being perfect a couple of times. Because if you can even half ass it for a good chunk of time, obviously, you don't want to, you know, half ass a bunch of things. But if you can at least be consistent for a period of time, even if it's not perfect, you're going to yield better results than being in a spot where you're trying to be perfect for a few days. And then you end up kind of falling off from everything that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the biggest things I had to learn when balancing life and a business as you know, my company started to grow, my team started to grow was giving myself grace for when all the habits didn't get checked off. Because when I didn't do something on my habits board, and then it would send me into this spiral of like, oh, the whole day is ruined. I don't have good energy now. And then I'm not feeling very confident in my conversations. And so just giving yourself grace for saying, hey, it doesn't have to be perfect all the time um, was a huge thing. And also recognizing that when I do the thing, I'm also not just getting my workout in, but I'm building trust for myself. I'm building more confidence when I commit to doing the things that I wanted to do in the first place. So it doesn't always mean I have to go and like absolutely crush it at the gym and just do the most intense workout ever. Sometimes just getting to the gym and doing it for 15 minutes and getting your walk in is better than not doing it at all to keep that consistency and that trust with yourself. A hundred percent, because it really is about keeping the promises that you make to yourself. And the more that you break those promises, the less trust you have in yourself. And in turn, it can literally make it that you're less likely to achieve any of your goals because you're constantly breaking your own trust. Like think about if you have like a flaky coworker or even a flaky friend and they're constantly flaking out, not doing what they say, you're going to trust them with a lot less. You're going to have less confidence in them and you're going to literally think that they cannot achieve what they might set out to achieve. And that's exactly what happens with yourself. So I find a lot of women struggle with confidence just altogether and a good way to even build confidence confidence and that trust in yourself is to literally keep the promises that you make. And that might be adjusting what those expectations that you have of yourself, because I I know a lot of women specifically do set very like big lofty goals, which I love. Like I'm all for setting huge goals, but we want to also realize how that fits into our day to day. And is that even realistic for me to get in and not realistic in the way of like, let's be realistic about things and like dampering down huge dreams. I'm saying realistic of, hey, if we only have 24 hours in a day, can this physically fit into a day? And that's where I've also had to bridge the gap of the word realistic of being like, oh, that doesn't mean I can't dream big. I can't have these huge goals, but I do need to be conscientious of what can be fit into a day. And I know that you talk a lot about time blocking and especially with you even talking about um, communicating with others about what your goals are or what your habits are. You had recently made a post talking about a habit hack, which was creating a skeleton schedule that puts you before your to-do list. So I think that that would be really helpful for people to hear because I actually do something extremely 
similar as I was swiping through. I was like, yep, yep, yep. Uh, but I'd love to be able to explain that to people of what that skeleton schedule really looks like so that you can put yourself before that to-do list. Yeah, I think where this idea came from, a good friend of mine, Anna, actually shared it at her mastermind. And I was like, I'm going to take that and kind of flip it, make it my own, call it a skeleton schedule. Um, but where it came from was the biggest excuse I would catch myself saying is I didn't have time for it today, no matter what it was, you know, especially as an entrepreneur, when you're working in the business, sometimes you catch yourself putting out a hundred fires and just jumping to task to task, doing all the busy work. And then at the end of the day, it's like, what did I even really do? I did everything. Um, and so we skip me, we would never skip a meeting with somebody else, right? If I scheduled a meeting with you, I would never skip that meeting, but we often skip meetings with ourselves. And so one day I was like, you know what, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to put everything I want to accomplish on my calendar. And I'm going to move them around when I do them. I'm going to turn them red when I don't do them and have this visual of how I actually do have that amount of time. And it turned into what I call the skeleton schedule, which is where you take an audit of your life. What are the mindset things you want to do, like meditation or visualization or, you know, spiritual growth, all of that, your physical health and wellness, you're going to the gym, eating nutrition, all of that. And then your relationships with your family, with your friends, social, all the things that you want to do, your non-negotiables in the day. And I plug them into my calendar before I add any business meetings. So I have work blocks for the gym, work blocks for non-negotiable work time where nobody else can bug me so I can do the important things on my business, work blocks for my walks, for my dinner, all of that. And that skeleton schedule of my non-negotiables are now there every single day. I see them and I schedule my meetings around them. And so our team now knows, hey, Rachel's busy at this time. I can't schedule her a meeting. I can't bug her when she's at the gym. And we're able to support each other a little bit deeper on building out that schedule. Mm -hmm. And I have created so many looms showing this to clients of how I build it out. And I know that I have gotten kickback before of people saying like, hey, I don't want to schedule my life to the second like you have it. So how do you feel that you navigate within the situation of, let's say someone responds that way of like, hey, I'm not wanting to schedule my life out to the second, um, but also with the aspect of like being strict because it's something of like, I feel within being a business owner, you kind of get misunderstood to a certain degree when it comes to having a strict schedule. And I've had a lot of people personally tell me of like, oh, you work too much or like, I wouldn't want my day to day to be like that, which I'm perfectly fine to say of like, that's fine. It's not your life. This is what I want to do. And I feel very good about what my goals are and what I'm going after. But I know it's not that easy for every single person involved. And it's also the aspect of how do you explain of doing all of this actually makes my life easier? Yeah, this is something I actually battled with a lot when I stepped into entrepreneurship too, because it's kind of figuring out that balance between your masculine and your feminine. Your feminine is that flow of like, I want to do whatever today. I want to feel good. I'm only going to do things that feel right with my energy. And then masculinity is your structure. And oftentimes, there's this, you know, kind of pendulum of going way too strong into productivity and hustle culture or going way too strong into like soft girl era. Mm -hmm. Everything is going to manifest and come to me with no action. Right. <laughs> and so kind of finding the balance between both. And I found that I'm the most productive when I have that structure and then I can be my feminine flowy self within that structure. Like I know, hey, this is my gym block and this is my time to pour into myself, but it doesn't mean I need to go lift a whole bunch of weights if I'm not feeling like I want to lift weights that day. I can use that time to go play pickleball or go do martial arts or go be active and just go on a walk and play with my dog. But the structure is I'm pouring into myself physically during this time. And honestly, I just believe that productivity is a form of self-care and sometimes it's not looked at like that. Um, because of how strong hustle culture has gotten on the internet. Yeah. Taking care of yourself is honestly one of the most productive things that you can do. And I often challenge people when they will say something of like, well, I don't have time to fit that in or like I'm doing too much. I recently had asked someone of like, 
because they were talking about, okay, I have stuff that I have to do for my kids. I have stuff I have to do for my work. And I'm like, I'm not minimizing how important those things are. But don't you feel like in turn, you are actually not doing what you need to do for your kids and your work because you can't be present because you haven't taken any time for yourself. And it's moments like those. And those are type of questions I ask myself when I start to get in my head of like, oh, I don't have time to do this, or I shouldn't be doing this. I should be doing something more productive. And I have to remind myself of like, for me to be my absolute best self, for me to do the best quality work, to be the most efficient comes down to literally having time for myself and pouring into myself. And actually earlier this week, it's been a really crazy week. And Monday, I kind of let myself fall by the wayside. And I was like, I'm not keeping this energy going into the rest of the week. And I texted Alex and I was just like, hey, no matter what, I am training tomorrow morning and I'm getting my steps in tomorrow morning before we do anything else. So like, that is going to be time I am doing and then whatever else I'll get done. But like that needs to be done. And it really set the tone and my energy for the rest of the day. Once I wasn't sitting there realizing like, oh, I don't get to do something for me or another day without my workout and having that constantly compound. And again, like we talked about of it just left me feeling really bad about myself, which then in turn, like how am I going to show up as my most authentic self, my most powerful self, my most aligned self if I I'm in my own head thinking negatively about myself. Absolutely. And also the mindset of every time I say yes to something, I'm saying no to something else. And so every time you say yes to doing the busy work or jumping to do something that's not on your calendar that you know is probably not the most effective thing that you can do in that moment, you're saying no to taking care of you or moving the needle forward in your business or giving your child that present time or your spouse that present time. Um, And so I like to ask myself that question is if something pops up that's going to conflict my time on my calendar, what of these two things would I rather say yes to? Because I have to say no to the other thing. And what's going to make me feel better? Like you said, if you pour into yourself, you're going to be able to show up more confident, be able to pour into your uh, your family members, be more present with them, be more loving because you're going to feel the best. And so it's not selfish to choose you in a moment because you're going to be able to then treat others even better when after you choose you. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible for you. You should lift heavy. High reps, Carbs low are reps. needed. Keto Squats are bad for your Squats needs. are great You should squat ass to grass. Toes. It's fine. It Macros fits my macros. for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Mm -hmm. And another way of like the aspect of whatever you're saying yes to, you're saying no to something else. Another saying that I like that I've heard recently is if you say yes unauthentically, uh, then you're actually saying yes resentfully. Like it turns into resent. And I have recognized that so much of just saying yes because you think that you should or whatever and you're not doing it truly because you want to, like you are just building resent. And resent is such a horrible emotion and feeling to have um, to be floating around there. But like you also said, when it comes to the schedule and that giving you that flexibility and that freedom, that's been something that has like rang so true for me of some people look at my schedule and they might think like, hey, that seems like a ton. But for me, being able to see it all laid out, seeing how much time it takes, it allows me to then decide what decisions because I feel like a lot of people get wrapped up in, okay, what is the priority or what decision do I need to make here? And for me, I'm trying to eliminate as many decisions as possible in a day because I know inherently I'm going to have to make a lot of decisions in a day. So I try to streamline that of, okay, my food's already prepped and ready. I don't have to make a decision about what I'm going to eat, when I'm going to eat, when I'm going to eat is in the calendar. Like it's in there. I'm going to get it done. 
same with my workouts. Okay, I have a plan. I know I get to follow it. I don't have to think about what I have to do next. And the same thing with my schedule of I cannot stand if I'm going into a day and it's like, I don't know what I need to do today. Like that is one of the worst feelings to have. But then you're like, I'm going to have to make so many decisions. And people will ask of how I can have such high output. And my only answer is like, I am so fiercely um, like, uh, like I so fiercely guard my calendar and my time. And I am so conscientious of, okay, if I am doing this and I really look at my weeks or my days as a week of, okay, maybe I could fit this into the day, but since I'm doing this and this, these other days, how is that going to affect my energy on that day of how I'm able to show up, how I'm able to do all of these different tasks? And again, that just allows me to show up to each thing, the best version of myself and the most prepared for everything uh, that I'm doing. Yeah, absolutely. One schedule that I've been playing with lately, and it's definitely not perfected, and this probably wouldn't pertain to somebody that has kiddos or, you know, a family that they have to pour into, but um, is turning my one day into two days. So I'll like go to the gym in the morning, work out, and then I'll start my work day. I'll get in some meetings, all of that, pause for lunch, and then I'll go spend some time with like my spouse or I'll go on a walk with friends. And that'll be around like 1, 2 p.m. And then I restart my day. So I'll go on another walk like it's my new workout. And then I'll do a little bit more meetings or back end work and then wrap up my day. So I'm actually having two days in one. And it helps me feel like I'm not staring at my computer for way too much time or overdoing any of those things because they're spaced out. But I'm also getting a lot more done than I would if I'm structuring it as a one day thing. Yeah, no, I love that. Have you ever heard of that aspect of like maker versus manager days? I have not. No. Okay, I'll have to send you the YouTube video. I'll make sure I link it for the podcast as well. But it's from Alex and Layla um, Hormozzi. And they talked about how um, what is needed for different positions in the business is different. Like for me versus Alex, I am someone who like I have a lot of meetings and I'm managing people. And And for me, maybe a block of like an hour or two, it's like, okay, I'm going to have like seven meetings in that. So there's like lots of slots. But for someone who's a maker where it's like, I need to sit down and focus and do this thing. uh, If I were to ask Alex for a meeting, even if it was like just 30 minutes in the middle of that, that completely wastes those three hours for him because to like be focused and get in to do that, that takes a very different like mental energy to be able to do. So they have like visuals and they really bring break down how they do it for their whole team of what days are maker days versus what days are manager days. And some people are just inherently like, you're a maker, you're a manager, but obviously you have to meet with people at some point. So then it's being able to say, all right, one day of my week, if I'm a maker is going to be, or a half day is going to be a manager day. And this is where I'm going to like let my days open for people to book for calls because I'm not going to have to focus and like dive into something super deep. Um, But they also talk about how they have one day that's kind of like a radio silence day of like, everyone's getting their shit done. We're not meeting. We're not talking about anything. Like you get that done. And I think that's helpful to look at it of what do I need from this day and what needs my energy? Like I, you won't see me trying to schedule like an appointment where I have to leave the house on like multiple days and especially not days in a row. No, I am clumping that as much as possible so I can make the best use of my time and, again, my energy as I'm going into things. And that also goes into realizing that just because you have that time on your calendar doesn't mean that it's free time. And by being able to truly look at your calendar beforehand, you're not stuck saying yes to those things that then when they come, you're like, I don't want to do this at all or I I don't have the energy to do this right now because you have taken inventory of like, what is the energy I need to actually take to this? And where's my focus going to be best as I'm going through this? I love that. We do something similar. We call them front end days and back end days. Um, Between me and my business partner, I'm kind of more like you where I'm front end doing a lot of meetings. She still does, but I'm more so doing that, running the team. And then she's doing the back end, the landing pages, the emails, the back end stuff. Um, So she needs that hour to focus in where I'm hopping back and forth between multiple meetings within one hour. Um, Yeah, I was going to say, oh, one thing I was going to say is we've actually done something kind of similar, but over the entire month. So this doesn't pertain to everybody's business model, but we have 
are when we're ovulating or she just had a baby. So her schedule is a little off. Um, But when we're ovulating is typically when we're the most, we have the most energy to talk to other people, to host an event, to be all out there. So we have launch week, which we're, we're ovulating, we're ready to go. We're doing a lot of front end stuff. And then typically when we're both on our cycle, that's kind of our back end week where we're just planning for the future we're nurturing some clients and we've built that business model to go with our cycle. Um, there's a really good book called In the Flow, which has helped us kind of build out that balancing, you know, our rhythms with the business. <laughs> I love that. I literally saw a reel yesterday where the girl, uh, they were talking on a podcast and I guess the girl had said like, oh, can you do this that day? And the one girl was like, I need to check my schedule. And the other girl goes, I don't have a schedule. And the girl, (laughs) rightfully so, is freaking out. She's like, what do you mean you don't have a schedule? She grabbed the girl's phone and like opened up the calendar and there was nothing on it. And she was like, I just kind of like go by vibes and all that. So she's like, so if someone asked you to go to dinner in two weeks, you want to put that in your calendar? She's like, you would put that in your calendar? She's like, that's one of the first things that I would do. And I was sitting there feeling so much like the first girl of like, how on earth would you even go off of just vibes for the day? Like that gives me so much anxiety to be in a spot where I'm like, I have no idea what I need to get done or what I've already agreed to do today. And I'm just going to raw dog it basically, just go into the day on vibes. There's no way. There's no way I could do it, especially to the point, I don't know if you saw on my skeleton schedule post, but like what our sales week looks like when our business is super busy. That's where I was like, Rachel will relate to this. (laughs) There's no way. Yeah, just like, I guess I'll be there. Like, I (laughs) know that's the first thing I tell people. I'm like, let me look at my calendar. Let me add that to my calendar now before I forget. Because it's in one ear and out the other for me. If you've told me something like that of like, hey, let's go get dinner in two weeks. If we haven't actually decided the time and it's not on my calendar, I'm not going to dinner. Like, you're not going to see me there. If it's not on the calendar, it ain't happening. I'm sorry. It is most definitely (laughs) not happening whatsoever. (laughs) But what do you feel like is one of the hardest like unspoken things about being a business owner? Ooh, I think it is simply the fact of wearing all of the hats in the beginning and not allowing that to burn you out to get to the point where your business is flowing pretty well, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah, it does um, make a lot of sense. <laughs> I think there's there's just this glamorized version of entrepreneurship online where it's like, boom, bang, pow, you do these five things. And now you have a six figure, seven figure business. And there's some truth to that, you know, building systems or building this X, Y, and Z and email list, whatever it does help. Um, But any entrepreneur, unless you have the overhead to just hire on teams, have partners that are experts in each area, if you're starting from scratch and you're bootstrapping your business, there's going to be a point where you have to wear all of the hats. And, and learn almost, how to wear the and, hats. <laughs> yes, and learn how to wear all the hats. And it's almost more beneficial in a way to start that way because mm-hmm. now that I've done a job within my company... I've perfected it. I've figured out how much time it takes me to do it. It's so much easier for me to train my team member and then see, okay, when they have questions, I know exactly how to solve the problem. See how long it's taking them to do that task. And if I can help them speed up that task, because I could do it faster. So it's really beneficial to learn all of the pieces and do it yourself before you delegate it in certain areas. Um, But that can be extremely overwhelming for someone that's a first time entrepreneur and they've never had to learn sales and learn marketing and learn the back end systems and all of those things and manage all of it. And I see so many people get to that point where they get really overwhelmed in their first couple years of business wearing all the hats that they hit burnout and then they don't continue. And right there is on the verge of them being able to take their business to the next level and put the automations and the delegations in place. Um, And that's why it's just so important to be mindful of your energy as you go through that grind phase to get to the point where you can have a little bit more freedom with your business. Mm -hmm. It is so true of like, I have learned how to do so many skills that I never thought that I would learn because I started of like, I just want to coach people. And that's what it started. And even when we became a business and it was Alex and I and other people involved, it was basically just like, 
you coach, you do your own thing. We're all going to do our own thing. We It was just like three coaches doing their own thing, basically, but then like us being a team all together. Then as we started having like our first assistant or our first coach on, it was like, okay, there's some more things that we need to do here to like actually make this a business and us just not being coaches. And now it's like to the point where I'm like, why do I know all of this about credit card processing? Why do I know all of this about (laughs) landing pages? I'm like, I don't feel like coaching. Like I obviously know a lot about coaching, but I'm like, the things I've spent time on recently to learn, I'm like, I have so many odd skills right now (laughs) that could be beneficial for someone, but I guess beneficial for ourselves. Uh, But it is so true of like, once you've done it, then it makes it so much better to be able to get someone else into it. Because it's like, you either need to, you know how to do it enough to train someone to help them elevate themselves and get into a better position, or you need to have the um, capital to be able to hire someone who's already an expert. And those are, it's a pretty big gap between those when you finally get to like, oh, I need someone someone who's actually an expert in this to get that. I mean, it takes a lot, especially if you are a startup and you're also maybe still trying to figure out finances because you are now trying to pay all these people when you only had to pay yourself to begin with because you were doing all of the jobs, Um, which does bring me to within talking about delegating. It's something where I know that you've identified yourself as like a hyper independent person. So how have you navigated within now having a team, letting other people support you, letting other people do things instead of just feeling like, okay, I need to hold on to doing everything myself. Yeah, absolutely. I That was one of the biggest things that I struggled with, with taking my business from one level to another level. We had hit a plateau and it was the same plateau that I had hit in my marketing agency as well, where it's like, I have no more time. I cannot bring on any more clients. I have no more capacity. And one of my biggest things was that I wanted control. I saw that I felt like I could do every task better than anybody else could. (laughs) And I didn't know fully how to teach people and Mm -hmm. have the patience to teach people how to do the thing. Um, And I, I pretty much drove myself into a wall. I completely burnt myself out. And that was the realization that I had to have of, I'm not going to be able to build a sustainable business to the growth that I have, the vision that I have in mind, if I do not bring people on this team to help execute on that mission. And it took lots of trial and error. It really did. And we like to say, sometimes the employees that get you from, you know, five figures to your first six figures or six figures to half half a million, whatever, um, there's going to be different team members that are with you to different levels. Sometimes you do have to shed those layers and bring on new team members for your next level. Um, but it came from trial and error. It came from maximum amount of accountability and communication. If I didn't have all the answers on how to train someone, admitting that and then building those SOPs together, um, Loom has been my best friend yes. to record my screen. Oh, I'm all um, about Loom having a Slack channel, setting boundaries. Like we talk a lot about our habits and our goals and making sure that Sam and I as the founders are taking care of ourselves, but also we have that standard with our team members as well. If they're not pouring into themselves and taking care of, you know, their health, their wellness, they're not going to be able to show up the best for our community. And also taking a step back and allowing people to shine where their expertise is. If, for example, we have a a team member named Lexi and she really just shines talking to people, um, being front facing, talking on the sales calls, and I would be doing her a disservice if I was trying to get her to do it the way I do it. So we really focus on what is that end result we have of this project and how can we get there no matter if you're doing it your own way or I'm doing it my own way and just trusting that it'll get done. Um, and that's been huge too. Yeah, I, I love that. And that's something we try to really uh, embody within our business. And it's something that we often say of like, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together, that it really does take a team to get to the next level. And of course, there are some situations, depending on what the business type is that someone can like, quote unquote, blow up and still be considered an entrepreneur where they don't have a lot of people on the team, but that's not the norm, so to speak. And being able to learn, you said it, communication is huge. Uh, And I find that, like you said, of like that end result, I think that also comes from you've set like what the mission is and what the values of the team are, that it's not like, hey, here's a list of how to do everything or here's um, like a rule on how to do everything. 
everything. It's like if it fits in within these values and within the mission, then we're going to reach what that end goal is. And I think people often overlook that of, oh, it has to be done this certain way or I did it this way. And I think that it's been so helpful to just be like, can we run it through these filters that it's still going to reach where we want it to so that it can give people that room to shine uh, and to grow? And I think that that would be if I were to answer of like what one of the hardest things of being a business owner is would be like hiring and managing people and like firing people or having the hard conversations about their performance. Like that has been one of the things that I did not expect. I don't know why I didn't expect it going into owning a business, but I didn't expect it to be like as hard and as trying as it is of like, you have to face yourself in the mirror and be like, are you showing up in the way that you're telling other people to? Did you give them the guidance or the clarity on how they needed to even do their job? Um, And are you letting them do their job and excel in that position? And when are you keeping track of the data to say when they maybe aren't doing as well when something might have to change because of it. Um, But it really does come down to being able to communicate with everyone. Um, And that's a whole other skill to be able to truly learn is like communication and like how to lead and or manage people is a lot to try and navigate for sure. It definitely is. And you're taking on this responsibility of other people's income, other people's mental health. I know personally, when I worked a nine to five, there was many people I worked for that were not good for my mental health. (laughs) And so you're, you're a parent to the people that work for you in a way you're like, you're leading them, um, you're guiding them. And I like to say that business in general, owning a business is 20% strategy and it's 80% mindset. It's 80% psychology. Um, and so the deeper that you understand yourself, the deeper you're going to be able to understand your team members, you're going to be able to understand your clients to get to that result. Um, And so any problem that we have, any team members that are struggling with anything, it's always a self-reflection journey of, you know, how can I look at this from their perspective, from their childhood, how they were raised to see why they made that decision before we talk about the next steps or the solution to the problem. Yeah, that's the thing that I would not have thought that I would have to like dive that deep, but it it is to be able to build the team that the culture is truly there, that they feel like that psychological safety as well as being able to continue to grow and improve. And it's not just a snap decision. If you didn't do this now, that's immediate that you're going to have some sort of... um, like you're going to be punished because you didn't do this. It's like, let's have a conversation to figure out why this actually didn't happen and what we can do to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Because that's the other thing of if you go to those fast decisions all of the time, you're not going to keep a t- team around. The dealing with uh, turnover <laughs> is so difficult if you're constantly having turnover, having to hire new people, train them, get them on. So I'm like, how can I keep the people that are already here that I don't have to continue to go through this process, allow myself to pour into myself, but pour into them to continue to allow them to do better? Because like with you talking about of the aspect of like them setting boundaries and making sure that they're taking care of their selves too, that's something we really push forward within physique development. And I'll even talk to people about like what boundaries they have within work. And I've had some people be like, oh, you like really care a lot about me. I'm like, I do. Like, I'm not dismissing that. But I'm like, it's also semi-selfish of if you actually have boundaries and have time away from work, I'm going to get a better worker when you're here. You are going to be more efficient. You are going to be more focused. And you are going to be the better version of yourself. So like, yes, I want you to be the better version of yourself for you. But also, like, as a business owner, I want you to be the better version of yourself. Like, that's going to help me and the mission altogether. And I think that a lot of people overlook that thinking like, oh, I just need to do what I'm doing instead of being able to look at what's going to take you to that next step. Absolutely. Absolutely. We had a little bit, I don't know if you've ever dealt with this, but we had a little bit of a culture shock um, with our team because we went from in-person events. We were hosting you know, 200 in-person events, an event every single week where we saw our team in person regularly too. We were working in offices in person to then going nationwide and now we're more virtual. So we don't fully see our team members. One of our team members is in Canada. We have, you know, team members all over and switching to that same amount of accountability and seeing each other and being supportive of each other virtually versus in person all the time. 
very different. Mm -hmm. It's like talking to your best friend that lives across the country sometimes. It's like we got to catch up on everything Mm -hmm. um, versus living that same lifestyle. Um, But there's also been so much beauty behind that too of of being able to support each other from afar and give our team members the ability to work from home and things like that too. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more with that. Um, You actually had posted a quote. I know it's one of your favorites from uh, Pitbull, which (laughs) I did have a uh, would you rather. Uh, I didn't write it down for like in these notes, but we did it on the podcast before. And it was, I need to find it because it was too funny. I'll, I'll bring up your quote first and I'll let you talk. And as you talk, then I will go and find the would you rather. But um as a pit bull lover yourself, you had talked about of once you create your own lane, there's no traffic. So I wanted to ask you of what it means to you to create your own lane. Yeah, absolutely. So Pitbull, actually, he has a special place in my heart. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I have dressed up as Pitbull at least three times with a bald cap at this point. You got the bald cap point. down, for sure. <laughs> um, I've got the bald cap down. Um, I went to one of his concerts a long, long time ago, and it was just the most high-energy concert ever. It felt like such good energy, and I feel like no matter what song Mr. comes Worldwide. up from him, <laughs> it just makes everybody dance. It's just good energy. Um, but being in your own lane, I think it just holds so much value to me because especially when starting my entrepreneurship journey, but honestly, in general, from doing bikini shows too, or, you know, trying to work on my fitness journey, trying to work on being a martial artist, we can get so caught up in comparing ourselves to other people, even like with social media right now. Oh, Mm -hmm. it's it's there right in front of your face. And sometimes you don't see the behind the scenes of all of the things somebody had to learn or go through in order to get to the point that they've arrived at. And we can be so easy to say, why am I not there? Why don't I have this? Why don't I have that when we don't see the behind the scenes? But when you're really focused on your own journey, you're really focused on where you're headed and what you've already overcome and who you are and your mindset and the things you're learning about yourself as you heal and work through your own traumas, then there's no other comparison besides yourself. And you can really just focus on being, I don't know who says it, somebody says it, 1% better every day. You can focus on just bettering yourself every day. And then there's no more competition. It's more, you're able to support each other. You're able to just cheer other people on because you know you're being your best version of yourself and you want to see them shine in their best light as well. I know it's always so, I feel like people think it's so cheesy when it's like, just focus on you, don't compare to other people. But I I cannot personally say enough good things about just focusing on what my goals are. Because when you do start, even if you're not necessarily comparing, if you do start getting so consumed on what someone else is doing, then I mean, just By the law of what time you have in a day, if you're spending that time focusing on someone else, you can't spend that time on yourself. And I often will be like, I have no idea what's going on in other people's lives. I have no idea what's going on with a lot of celebrities. Like people will bring things up to me and I'm like, I I feel like I live under a rock, honestly, because I am just focused on what I want and what I want to succeed in. And that's not saying of like, hey, you can never watch reality TV or never get caught up in anything. Like I still have things that I watch. And like, if you ask me about Top Chef, I'll I'll know everything about it. But I am likely not going to know as much information about other stuff because I'm just focusing on what I need to get done. And that just allows me the time to actually get that shit done, which then ends up making me feel better, ends up getting me closer to my goal um, and being able to to rock in that way. But I did find the pit bull, would you rather here? So would you rather all songs exist, but they are all performed by pit bull or (laughs) only one pit bull song exists, but it's performed by all artists with their own interpretation? (laughs) I just saw like... I don't even know the wildest performer screaming fireball on stage. And I think that would be so cringy. So I think I would rather the first one, the first right. option. So you was want it to be all Pitbull all songs, songs or all songs or performed by Pitbull? Performed by Pitbull, yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine him singing like California Girls though? <laughs> Oh my gosh. I just feel like so many of his songs sound so similar. I mean, that's with a lot of artists, you would say. But then thinking about him singing like some Taylor Swift or him singing like some hard like metal or something. It's just hilarious. Yeah, country. It's like, what would that even be? 
as much of a Pitbull fan as I am, I don't think either avenue would yeah. be ideal. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just uh, none of the above. <laughs> none of the above. <laughs> um, Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program. Because you are awesome and I want you to have this program, I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Now within, um, we were talking about um, habits earlier on. Is there one habit that you are wanting to add going into 2025 here in a couple of months, which it's crazy that it's like two months away, not even two months away, but is there a habit that you're looking to add to your life right now? Ooh, yes. I think one of the things that I would love to add going into 2025, this is seasonal. I feel like I've added this into my life before, but I really want to step into a season of learning again. I definitely go through seasons of learning and then action, learning, then action. Oh, and my yeah. next season is, you know, working with mentors, absorbing information and just working on bettering myself coming out of a season of lots of action, specifically in business. And what would you say if you were to sum up like the top three to five things that you feel like you've taken action on in this past year for your business, what would those be? Yeah. So we went from being, like I said, full in-person events to mostly virtual events and then just a couple in-person events a year. And that was a huge transition. I am not a systems person. That goes right over my head. So I had to learn <laughs> a lot about landing pages and back-end systems. Um, but that was the biggest shift. And then shifting our team and our clients to that new experience and um, you know just that new standard. Another thing personally has just been leveling up myself, taking myself out of working in the business onto working on the business and getting to do those fun things like launching the podcast or stepping more into content um, and stuff like that, more that front facing. So in this next season, I want to take those things and take them to the next level. We plan to grow our virtual events even more, speak more, launch season two of podcasts and, you know, act on those things I learned last season. My next season of learning is going to be a lot more of just inner work. How can I be the most productive version of myself? How can I see things a little bit differently, hitting new financial goals, um, learning from coaches that have already done it. One of our goals is to pack a stadium one day. And there's a lot that we have to learn just on the back end logistics of how to even navigate 10,000 people in one room. Um, so that's really what I'm, I'm diving into learning for this next one. Yeah. Have you ever read the book, uh, 10 times is easier than two times? I have not, but I'm going to put it on my list. Okay. I will send you the link for it. So it's something where I got sent it actually earlier this year from, um, our financial advisor, actually. And the whole premise of the book, which just connects to like you wanting to get to those 10,000 people, is that if you want to double your business, that the thing to double your business isn't the thing to get it to 10 times where it's at. And so people look at their business and they start to make these little changes that it's like, oh, maybe this is going to get me to like this next little marker. But we should really be looking at what would take it to actually 10 times the business because the like you said the things that take you to one part aren't necessarily going to get you to the next part and so you can of course still make those small changes and have like these incremental rises but overall if your goal is this bigger goal then really looking at what does it take to get to that goal and looking at that 10 times instead of just looking at what it takes to just make that two times change and so the whole concept of the book is it goes into a lot of examples examples, a lot of people like throughout history who have like utilized this and talking about how like, again, 
the thing that's going to take you to two times is not the thing that's going to take you to 10 times. So look at what's actually going to take you to 10 times and start implementing that now instead of thinking and dreaming so small of, okay, if I can make this next little level up and it might like 1 million to 2 million, that's not necessarily small, but if you're thinking of what's going to get me to 10 million, then like that's a completely different strategy that you're taking to be able to get that level up. Um, And so it's really great mindset wise to be able to look at it that way because I feel like so often you kind of get stuck in the hustle and the bustle of the daily and what small change can I make here? And those small changes still might need to be made. But if you're looking at that grand scale of, okay, if I want to pack a stadium, versus like the, I know you've packed room, like big rooms before. I'm not minimizing that by any means, but like to pack the next level of room, if you're like, okay, I just want to get 500 people in a room. If I want to get a thousand people in a room, what it takes to get 10,000 people in a room, like that's very different logistically. And so it's starting to look at what does that take because I'm going to need to figure it out anyways. So I might as well figure it out now to then make that jump to where I want to go. So valuable, such valuable information. And it's so true. Sometimes we minimize our goals or we think we have to hit certain stepping stones before we get to that big goal. But the truth is you can take giant leaps in your business. I mean, we went really quickly from zero people showing up to an event to 400, 500 people showing up to an event. And that's a, that's a lot oh, of people when you think about lot. them being in a room. <laughs> and like literally when I, I was talking with Alex the other day, cause he was like, who are you podcasting with? And I said, um, I was like, well, I'm just so uber impressed by Rachel because like live events is like a whole other beast. Like webinars are already like a beast. Like I'm not, again, minimizing what it takes to put on a webinar or a virtual event, but like actually getting people to show up at a live event is a lot of fucking work. And it's really (laughs) hard where people might raise their hand and say, I'm interested, but actually getting there, like even take the webinar we just did of 50% of the people who said that they were interested actually showed up versus like, okay, what if everyone would have showed? Like, it's so different when you're actually doing an in-person event. And it's so impressive to me when people do put on in-person events, not only because of all the logistics behind the scenes that I know about, but just the aspect of actually getting someone to commit and come somewhere. Um, Because I also know like I'm a homebody. So I'm like, I want to stay at my home. (laughs) But actually people being like, I'm coming to this. I'm traveling for this. Like that is insane. And especially like 500 people in a room is a lot of people. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And we've done it in so many different ways and every single way there's a completely new beast. Um, from conferences to small networking events to retreats, there's a different beast because you're having people literally commit to traveling across the United States, oftentimes to a state they've never been to before, finding hotels, finding friends to stay with because they know nobody there. Um, But there's also so much beauty in bringing people together, whether it's virtual or in person, when it makes the mission far bigger than you, when they actually get to chat with each other and feel the magic in the room and learn from each other and realize that they're not alone in their problems. So I will always stand on the ground of hosting events is a beast and it's yes. terrifying and it'll probably make you cry in your closet a couple of <laughs> times. Um, but it's also such a beautiful thing to be able to cultivate that community and bring people together. So I love it. Yeah, it's always really special when you do get to actually connect with people in person because it's different from even just like you and I talking on this versus actually being able to connect in person. Um, And it it is really special to be able to do that and get people that have similar mission or values in the same room. It just can get really magical because also within us talking about big goals, like it matters of who you spend time around, what type of content you consume from people that are doing big things. Like I am someone who I really follow closely people that are like doing big things with their life. And that's who I also try to talk to is people who are wanting big things or doing big things that then makes me even reconsider like, are my dreams even big enough? Or how can I continue to grow this and do this more? And just seeing people do things that seem so difficult, it's so empowering of like, okay, then like, what can I do to get to that level or get to that next level or how that even reflects to what I'm doing? Because comparison can be 
really hard, but it's, I don't think it's even comparison. That's the thief of joy. I think it's more of the judgment you put on yourself. Once you compare, um, that is more of the thief because I've seen comparison be something so powerful for me to take that next step versus being like stealing all of my joy. But it comes down from being able to figure out, am I just going to judge myself? Cause I'm not where that person is, even though, like you said earlier, I don't even know what they've been through to get there. Or am I going to use this to inspire? inspire me, to motivate me, to show what's actually possible um, for something that I might have thought was impossible. Absolutely. I had a question pop to mind. I hope you don't mind if I switch the roles here and ask (laughs) you a question. Um, But I felt the exact same way when I met you and when I met Alex. It's like you guys are doing big things. You're ambitious. You go after your goals. You guys have cultivated an incredible business. You run an awesome team, all the things. But I want to ask, what is it like hosting and running a business with your spouse? And what have been the big things you guys had to jump through to be able to build what you've built together? I love this question, and we do get it a lot. Uh, But it's something where it honestly has helped our marriage a lot. And I know that's not that same for everyone, but it basically made us go into a fast lane of you guys better learn how the fuck to communicate or this all comes burning down. Because just honestly, our first year of marriage, I hadn't joined physique development. I was still doing my own coaching and I was like Sue Gaines coaching. I know it's like a super creative name, Uh, but I was doing my own thing and we were just kind of like both coaching. And it wasn't until um, like our second year of marriage that we were like, like, okay, let's go ahead and blend this together and let, let's make it one company. And that first year of marriage, I mean, we were long distance the whole time we were dating and engaged. So that's one aspect of like, hey, we didn't actually get to spend that time with each other. Like, yes, we knew each other. And obviously now seven, eight years later, it was the right choice. But it was something where we only had weekends every other f- few weekends with each other where we're trying to be as present as possible versus like living in your daily life. That's very different. As well as we both came from very different family dynamics as far as like my family spending a lot of time together in the evening and his family, it was kind of like everyone do their own thing. And so that also had things where we're trying to learn how to communicate with each other. And it just feels like we're butting heads. And that first year was really freaking hard. And when we did join businesses, not only did we finally have that first year behind us where we had to have a lot of hard conversations, but then it ended up of, oh, shit how things are going between us ends up directly reflecting on everyone else. Because if we can't communicate, if we don't have the vision lined up, if we don't know what's going on, how is anyone else supposed to know what's going on? And so it like demanded for us to get so much better at communication, along with the fact of early on with us owning the business together, he was also my coach when I was doing shows. And so it was, okay, we're wearing the hat of husband and wife. We're wearing the hat of co-owners. We're wearing the hat of coach and client. And we, the way that we've gone about it is being able to have very clear boundaries on those things. And sometimes it even comes down to like, I'm talking to you as a business owner or like as your co-owner, or I'm talking to you like as your wife, this is what I'm saying to you. And sometimes we have to like verbally out loud make that distinction of like, hey, as your wife, this is what I'm saying versus like as your partner in this business, this is what I'm saying. And we also have rules of you are allowed to say at any point, like, I am not in the place to talk about business because we live together, we work together, and PD, like, is our life for all, all, all intents and purposes. Like, we are extremely invested in PD, and it's something where, like, even last night after the webinar, we're sitting and we're eating, and then Alex, we're just watching, like, a show, and then he's, like, he pauses it, and he's, like, I think that we could have done this, this, and this, and I was, like, I'm really not in the place to talk about work right now, and that used to be something where I felt, like, oh, he wants to talk about about it, I have to talk about it now, or vice versa. And then it would end up being like, I didn't get a chance to check out, or I didn't get a chance to just take time or talk to my husband. And so that's something where there's no questions asked after that. There's no like hard feelings of like, well, I want to talk about it. It's this isn't during normal business. We're not in a meeting. Obviously, if we're in a business meeting, I can't be like, I'm not in the place to talk about business. (laughs) But if we are doing our own thing and he brings it up, and sometimes we do talk about it. Like some couples I know that work together. They're like, we have a rule of like no business talk at dinner. And like, we don't make those 
those hard and fast rules. We just have the one understanding of if someone is not in the place to talk about it, they are going to speak up. Otherwise, they've lost the like right to say, like, I didn't want to talk about that. So that's been extremely helpful for our relationship. And it's just that I feel like it helps us personally because we're just both so bought into the same goal and the same vision. And I know that, again, that dynamic doesn't work for everyone. And it's something that we had to figure out what our roles were as far as even not only that masculine and feminine energy, but also within the fact of I thought that I was just always going to be a coach. And then stepping into, okay, I'm now kind of like a manager of people until now it's like everyone knows I'm the CEO of the, the business. And that's something that we've had to have hard conversations of like, if I'm the CEO, then and what I say at the end of the day goes because this is what you're saying that I am the person who knows what they're doing in this realm versus like if you are going to be this role, then like I have to default to a certain degree to you because you are supposed to be the expert in that role. Um, and so it's just led to overall better communication skills and better understanding of each other to then continue to build on what we're doing. But it really does all come down to the communication so that we even know. And like our shared calendar is like a saving grace <laughs> to be able to know what the person is doing and not have to be like, what, what is that that you're doing again? We can just look at the calendar. I'm like, I know what you've got going on. This is what we're going to talk about. Um, but there's also a lot of trust between the two of us of like, we trust each other that they're going to get the job done. Um, but we also trust the fact of like, we're both working in it together. Like, like I said, this week was a really hard week. And there was one day where I was like, I, I, on Monday, I just broke down and started crying at breakfast. I was having a really freaking hard culmination of weeks. And it was something where I did not want to work that day at all. But seeing Alex, who I know he was tired too, and he likely didn't want to work that day, him showing up and working hard, I was like, I need to work today because like the person that I care about the most is working on this and showing up and I care so much about him. Like it's a respect thing for me to show up and still get the job done. And so it's just been a really positive experience for us, which is just so funny because my parents grew up working together in the same job and I used to make fun of them. And I used to be like, I could never do that. I need my separate time. And now it's like we spend all of our time together, but we can't even get enough of it. Like when he's gone or like, I don't see him for a day because like I'm in meetings. I'm like, I missed you all day today. It's like we spend Aww. every day together. We should probably not miss each other. <laughs> That's beautiful. I think it really does come down to the person that you choose to do it with too, because communication is so valuable. And me and my business partner talk about this too. Is like we're in a marriage. A business yeah. is a marriage. Uh -huh. Um and really just summarizing, summarizing our entire conversation today. I think whether you're trying to grow a business, or you're just trying to get better at your habits and your scheduling, boundaries and communication is the answer mm -hmm. 100%. No matter what it is in life, when you have good boundaries, you understand what your boundaries are, and then you learn to be able to communicate them, you're going to be able to scale, you're going to be able to be the best version of yourself, especially if you're a high achiever and you're choosing the unconventional paths. Nobody else is going to understand the things you're doing when you have business ideas or you're changing your path in life. Um, and so being able to learn how to communicate those things, it's so valuable. Yeah. I I mean, I, if it wasn't obvious enough, I couldn't agree more. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's even something where we talk a lot about when it comes to a relationship of what we feel. Because, I mean, we got, we got engaged after knowing each other for six months. And again, we were long distance the whole entire time. So we honestly barely knew each other. He bought the ring at three months and then proposed at six months. And so a lot of people were kind of like, you guys are moving really fast, which we were. Like, I'm not going to try and negate that. But we had a lot of conversations about, like, what do we want out of life? And I I think that that's a huge part when it comes to a relationship in general, but uh, especially if you're talking about like your spouse, your spouse is likely the person that you spend the most time with overall. They're going to have one of the, even if you don't spend the most time with them, they're going to have one of the biggest impacts on your life because what their mentality is, what their goals are, how they act towards things, that's going to directly affect you. So if I was with a partner that constantly was like, okay, I'm a nine to five clock in, clock out, and like, I don't care about the other stuff, then I 
I would probably be made to feel guilty for working different hours and like pushing for this certain goal. And then that might drag me down to be a version of my life that I don't want. And we had a lot of conversations very early on of like, what is your vision and your dream for your life? And what do you actually want that to look like? Not just like, oh, I'd I'd love to make money. It's like, yeah, everyone would love to freaking make money. But like, what are you willing to do to get there? And that's something where, again, like we just have the vision and it becomes, I think it's a Tim Grover quote where it's like, crave the end result so intensely that the work becomes irrelevant. And that's something that we align on so much of we know what our end goal is. And I feel like it also comes from like that deep belief. And you talked about it earlier of like you have to continuously believe in yourself time and time and time again, even when everything is stacked up against you and it feels like I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing or what the next step is. You have to keep believing in the vision. You have to keep believing in the mission no matter what. Even if you're crying into your freaking pancakes at breakfast, you have to believe in the mission and you have to pick yourself up and go and do that next thing. And I think that's something where not everyone has that in them. I think that they can have that in them. But the thing that we believe has gotten us to where we are is our belief in ourselves because there's been multiple people along the way that told us we couldn't do it or we shouldn't do it or it was stupid. And if we let those thoughts get into our head and we started to doubt ourselves, like this all would have come crashing down years ago. Um, So I definitely agree that it's communication and boundaries, but it's also just an undying and honestly a shouldn't make sense type of belief in what you're going for because it's also if you're an owner of a business if you are the entrepreneur you have to believe in it more than anyone else on the team because all of that belief and that vision comes from the top and so if you don't have the vision if you don't have the belief you're if you're sitting there wondering like why my team isn't doing what they need to do or why do I feel like things aren't going the way I want Well, they don't even know the vision that they're supposed to be following because you've lost track of it and you don't believe in it anymore. Yeah, yeah. That is why to full circle this conversation, that is why meditation and visualization is the top tier on my habits chart every single day. And oftentimes it's looked at as very woo-woo manifestation. That's a whole other story of what works (laughs) and what doesn't work. But literally just taking a moment with yourself to see what it is that you want for your life and train your brain to believe you are capable and it's possible for you is so valuable to then be able to show up and communicate that vision. And I feel like if you can't see it, you can't believe it. Um, And so I like to do that every morning is like, okay, what is my end goal in mind for even for today? If I can't see a month ahead, how do I want to make people feel today when I'm around them? How do I want to feel when I'm doing all the things on my to-do list today? What is it that I want the day to look like? And visualizing myself go through it. And then, of course, long-term visualizing those future goals of packing the stadiums or growing the business and really focusing on how I want to feel when I accomplish this, making my brain believe that I already accomplished it because that's when you're able to go into the day with complete confidence that you're capable of even accomplishing what you're taking action on. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I if I remembered the exact uh, lyric from a Russ song, then I would say it, but it's something to do with that. So I it's will just there. leave it at that. <laughs> it was something like I was rich far before I was or like, whatever it was, I knew I was going to butcher it. So that's why I didn't even say it. I knew it was going to hold the same power. Maybe <laughs> I'll add it in track. the show notes. <laughs> but um, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, finish things off there with an absolutely butchered quote by myself. Um, but uh, thank you so much for joining us. Maybe we will have another podcast all about manifest station uh, because it's not just about like, oh, I want to do this thing. It is also about the next steps that come after that um, and being able to go from there. But I appreciate you so much, Rachel. Like I said, I will have her information, her like Instagram, her business, her podcast all in the show notes um, so that you guys can go follow along her journey um, and see how she continues to not only motivate me, but uh, thousands of other badass women as well. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And this week, I got to see a little bit of the behind the scenes of just how much energy and love love you guys put into the virtual events that you do with (laughs) the people in your community. So if anybody's listening and they haven't experienced one of your little webinars, I definitely recommend that they hop on because I see how much you guys pour into your community with those. Thank you. Yes, we've had a lot of fun and love connecting with people. So we'd love to have any of you guys join us. Uh, (laughs) Thanks so much for listening to the Physique Development Podcast. We'll catch you in the next one.